you and uh, thank you everybody for coming to this session on Venezuela. Uh, uh, we are very, uh, it is our immense pleasure to be co-organizing this session with the Venezuela chapter of the Alba Movements. And we have the honor of uh, inviting our several guests tonight. Uh, this is the seventh South-South uh, Forum on Sustainability that we are organizing this year. The first one was in uh, 2011. And during that first one, we had the pleasure of meeting a lot of our friends from all the, the uh, five continents. And since then, we have been organizing the South-South Forum and every time with some uh, different uh, emphasis on the themes, yet the, the central theme that has run uh, through all the time is the uh, question about uh, community regeneration. And we are very happy this time that we have uh, as the first speaker, uh, uh, Mr. Jose Feliz Rivas, because uh, we have been ha having a long history of uh, collaboration with him. When in the year 2011, we started a comparative study of seven emerging countries, which included China, India, Indonesia, uh, in uh, Venezuela, Brazil, Turkey, and South Africa. And the lead uh, researcher at that time was uh, Dr. Jose Feliz Rivas. So, and in this, um, this year in January, uh, we had also organized a delegation from Lingnan University to go to Venezuela. And we went to see some of the communes and the agroecological school and had a lot of discussions with our friends. And we had been very um, um, inspired by your efforts to try to um, look for uh, more autonomy, uh, to try to resolve the question of food sovereignty, despite the very, very difficult situation of the sanctions by the USA. And so it is our pleasure today to be uh, listening to you. And we hope that um, there will be more opportunities for us to be working together. So now I would hand over the um, uh, moderation to uh, Hernan Vargas, who has been uh, also uh, doing a lot of work on the album movements, on international collaboration, and in fostering solidarity. Thank you, Hernan. Thank you, Kinchi. Greetings for everyone that is with, with us here now in this session in Venezuela. We are actually very happy to be here sharing with you. We have enjoyed all of the whole seven South South Forum on Sustainability. Uh, and now here, we are about to start this session in Venezuela. Our friends uh, from the South South Forum has told us about this question, uh, about how the situation on this triple trap that they call between the pandemic, the climate crisis, and the economic turn down. So in order to answer to that and pose some uh, uh, thoughts for the discussion, we have here a very diverse panel. In one hand, we have Jose Felix Rivas, which is an economist and former uh, part of the board of the Central Bank of Venezuela, who will give an overview of the economic situation during these years. But we also will have our friend Anna Felician, which is researcher in food sovereignty, in order that she can give us a big picture of the whole situation not only uh, from the national level, but also from the grassroots. What are the challenges? What are the responses? On the other hand, we have our friend Juan Carlos Rodriguez, which is part of the urban, urban settlers movement, who is gonna speak about the different kind of struggles from the urban land in Venezuela. And finally, we will have uh, Mariana Garcia, which is uh, from a feminist organization called Faldas RR, which is an organization dedicated to promote an education for the safe abortion. So in this case, she will give us a picture about the human rights situation and the different kind of feminist agenda. And finally, 
uh, we have to excuse because our friends from El Maizal commune hadn't been able to be here with us all today. They were about to send a, a video, but they also have difficulties for that. So maybe at the end of the presentations, I will give you some little comments about the, the, the commune process in Venezuela and also the people's economies in order that our, our participants can have some views about it. Maybe in order to introduce the first presentation, I think that it's important to give some context. We, it's important to add to this uh, triple trap that you uh, uh, give us as a reference for the discussion that we also think that in the Venezuela case, we, we think that this is part the climate crisis and the economic turn down, downturn it's part of a civilizatory crisis of the capital system. So in that sense, we think that we have different kind of demonstrations. Uh, for example, as Kinchi, men Kinchi mentioned in one of the previous sessions, uh, last year we have a, a, a warming in the Antarctic about uh, 57 degrees. So and to that uh, global warming, the best, the, the biggest contributions are for the center countries like USA, like China, and from the European Union. In the case of Venezuela, uh, actually the contribution till uh, 2010 were about 0.4% of the whole contribution of emissions of dioxide of carbon. That's kind of an, an, a figure about the whole situation of the climate and the contribution of Venezuela. In the other hand, of course, Venezuela has been performed as a, a nature extraction economy, basically oil and mining. And in that sense, of course, the environment issue is quite important, but in a local level, is not a, a global level, is not a contribution to the, to the global warming, uh, at least not quite important. Also, in, the, in, the, in that sense, we think that it's important to add that one second point that adds to that confirmation of crisis, it's about the crisis of imperial hegemony. The United States has a crisis of its whole dominion pattern of the world, and as a result of that, we think that we have some expressions like this so-called uh, Cold War with China, which is part of the efforts to recompound the hegemony of the United States. And in that sense, uh, we are living uh, a divided continent where you have uh, friends, allies, countries for the United States, and you have enemy countries for the United States. In the enemy side, we have Venezuela, we have Cuba, we have Nicaragua, and in some sense, Argentina and Mexico are not exactly enemies, but are kind of possible uh, neutral in that dispute. But it's important to say that in the side of the enemy, we have a lot of sanctions. In the case of Venezuela, we have since 2013, about 130 uh, measures, uh, unilateral uh, coercitive measures, which is what we call sanctions. And they are uh, addressed to uh, stop the possibility of Venezuela to international trade, the capacity to import, to export, and also the capacity to have uh, endowment and have credit from other countries. And also, uh, it's the other part of the sanctions is about kidnapping some resources of Venezuela overseas. Like, for example, res recently, uh, the UK has uh, actually retained, uh, has, take, has took control, has stolen uh, 31 uh, tons of gold that is part of the National Reserve of Venezuela. And that's also part of this uh, escalator of sanctions against us. So we think that it's important to, to emphasize in that situation that has actually give some results in our current situation uh, of the decreasing the budget income, the oil income, 
but also uh, uh, decreasing the capacity of endowment, the capacity of credit. Uh, what I want to add to this thing about the imperial crisis and the whole situation of sanctions and blockade in Venezuela is that the result is that uh, in uh, 2013, we have an income, a national income, about $42.6 billion. But at the end of 2019, we had a total income of four, only $4 billion. So we have only the 10% that the, that the whole budget with the one we were able to finance the whole uh, uh, universal rights for the population, the universal rights that are actually protected in the Bolivarian Constitution. So that's an important issue. It's about to uh, break the spine of the material reproduction of the Bolivarian Revolution. And we think that I, that's also an important uh, issue to address. And maybe with that context, uh, I, I maybe can add a third one before I pass to the first speaker, which is about the a crisis of the colonial uh, model uh, for Venezuela, which is based on the oil income, which is uh, part of a process of uh, speed urbanization, as you actually call in one of the papers from the E7 uh, team, but also is part of a logic of extraction, not only of the commons of the nature, but also financial extraction. So there's a, a double pattern of extraction. But also we have uh, this that Professor Michael Hudson called dollarization, which is also part of the double cost transfer process that we have in the global capitalism. In the case of Venezuela, these last years, uh, among the, the dollarization has been a process of depreciation of the uh, national mon uh, bo money, which is the Bolivar. And that's also part of this arrangement where we have an economy which is centered in the oil income circulation. Uh, it's not about production. It's not about production of goods and rights and services. It's about uh, circulation of the oil income. It's about circulation of capital. So maybe one of the uh, most important disputes that we have right now in Venezuela is about what kind of model do we have to transit on? We have to go into a, uh, maybe a post oil income dependence system. The, the discussion right now is what is the system? It's uh, some kind of restructuration of the capital circulation system, or it's another one with another kind of uh, rationalities, with another kind of dynamics like self-sufficiency, like social reproduction, and like uh, uh, a communal rationality. Maybe most of that will be the issues that are our speakers now. We will uh, discuss from different angles. So with this introduction, maybe I can uh, pass the word to our first keeper, as, as speaker, our friend Jose Felix Rivas, uh, who has been not only former uh, Central Bank uh, Director of Venezuela, but also has been ambassador to UNASUR, and he's also part of a, a Latin American Center of Investigation of Economic. He has uh, been specialized in development studies. So, please. In this presentation, I am going to talk about each of these adverse factors. I will not go deep into the depending capitalist crisis in Venezuela because that requires a special presentation. So, the world economic crisis is at the same time within a global crisis, which has several dimensions. So it is perceived as a civilization crisis, a crisis of our way of life, where we can highlight very particularly the environmental and climate dimension. Since mid uh, 2019, we forecasted a reduction in the global economic activity. 
the pandemic accelerated and deepened this uh, slowing trend and transformed it in the very short term into a very big recession. The planetary automat, as uh, called by Carlos Marx, this uh, is, is in a heart attack. The pandemic located the first epicenters in the three global factories. First Asia, then Europe, then it was installed in the United States, and finally it stopped in Latin America. The fault of the world economic crisis is the fall of the demand of raw material, the main product of the, for the export to the periphery. The Venezuelan economy is part of this depending periphery. The historic way of which to, we, to be articulated to the world economy for, since the 20th century has been mainly through a very particular merchandise, which is oil. This seems evident, but it is very important to highlight this feature that is going to determine the degree of dependency that we have. This is important because this merchandise makes the world go round. Oil moves the global economy as the main source of energy and provides a huge number of byproducts. The planetary automata feeds mainly from oil. Normally, it requires between 90 and 100 million barrels a day. That was the demand of oil until mid 2018 and beginnings of 2019. However, before coronavirus, before the pandemic, the global supply of oil was higher than the demand. The fall of the global economic activity leads to the fall of the consumption of oil. At the beginning of April, due to the pandemic, it is estimated that this demand of oil was reduced by 30 million barrels a day. As a result, oil was storage and inventories were saturated all around the world. In April 2020, we see a landscape of tankers floating full of a load that cannot reach its destination. And we also see land deposits that cannot be, that cannot receive any more production. Then we had a strong decrease of the oil prices. The oil export basket is mainly made up by heavy crude oils. At the beginning of April, the fall of oil prices was reducing significantly the margin between the production costs of some of these oils and their prices in the market. In summary, we had a fall of the demand of oil because of the fall of the global economy, especially of the main consumers, that we had a fall in the oil prices and we had an oversupply of oil and the byproducts. The expectations of recovery are very pessimist and in spite that the Chinese economy started working again, it will not be enough to compensate for this fall. This means for Venezuela, a reduction to the extreme of fiscal income, as Hernan said, before. Oil, for us, over 95% of Venezuelan exports, around 50% of the fiscal income, and around 17 to 20% of the GDP, the economic blockade. At the same time, we have a financial and economic blockade. We have the effect of the unilateral coercive measures applied by the U.S. administration since 2015. The strategy of American imperialism has been focused on reducing the capacity of production and exporting of Venezuelan oil. They have three objectives. First, they want to extract from the global market the Venezuelan oil supply in line with the energy strategy created since the Obama administration, and it continued with Donald Trump. They tried to position the supply of shale oil. And at the same time, this strategy shares the objective of weaken the OPEC and other important oil producers. That is why it faces Russia, Iran, and Venezuela. The second objective 
of these sanctions is to recover or to consolidate a geopolitical influential area so that Latin America can become their backyard to ensure energy sources, raw material, and also liberalize the economies in order to dissolve their national states and clear the territory for transnationals. Finally, the third objective is to eliminate any political resistance represented by nationalist governments or progressive governments and by, by social movements that want higher degrees of sovereignty, economic independence, and alternative ways of production and of life. In this manner, in the field of political action, they want to suffocate the Venezuelan public budget because when they decrease the capacity of functioning of the Venezuelan government, they will create social political discontent that is necessary for the fall of this government. And then their replacement by a government that is aligned with the geopolitical interests of the United States. The sanctions against the current government of, the, of Venezuela have, have to be understood within a global confrontation of recomposition of American and European hegemony in front of the economic, emerging economic blocs. So this imperial strategy it goes beyond the replacement of the Bolivarian government. They want to dissolve this revolution to consolidate an area of regional influence. Naomi Klein called this the capitalism of disaster. And the Brazilian Antonio Unis Bandeira called this a formula for chaos. In the case of actions such as terrorist actions, economic boycotts carried by the United States in Chile to overthrow the government of Salvador Allende. As Kissinger said, and also Barack Obama, they want to strangle the economy. And this has been expressed in first, the illegal seizing of external assets of the nation. Amongst them, the company Citgo, located in the United States of Venezuelan property, the bank deposits distributed all around the world, and the gold reserves deposited in the Bank of England. Secondly, it is expressed in the blockade of foreign trade in the main items of exports, such as oil and gold. And third, sanctions to public officers in key seats in order to destroy the capacity of the government and the state to manage external transactions. The threats and the coercion to the ship companies transporting Venezuelan oil and the refineries receiving it and processing them had led Venezuela to increase the storage of the oil that's produced and a fall in the exports. The fall in the production levels is a result of the sanctions. Right now, we estimate that we are producing under 800,000 barrels of oil per day. That is a level of production which is significantly low to the, than the presence, than the levels of Venezuelan production that were over 3 million barrels a day. This gives us an idea of the impact of the sanctions on the Venezuelan economy. They limit to the extreme the capability of the Venezuelan economy to import intermediate and capital consumption goods, but also reduces the capacity of the government to import items related to food, health, and oil supplies. It is important to remember that the sanctions do not only affect the government, but they also block the international transactions from the private system. They especially affect the internal production activities that require the support of the national trade and international financial system. The economic analysis of the last years cannot omit the political confrontations that have been happening since the Nicolás Maduro 
took the presidency, the opposition forces have opted by an insurrection strategy under different modes, which include the direct support of foreign superpowers. And this has changed the economy profoundly. Political destabilization comes with economic destabilization. This fight comes with the control of oil and other natural resources which generate a high profit and also wants to disarticulate any alternative expression to promote an autonomous national development with a high degree of sovereignty. This is important because most of economists, especially neoclassical and right-wing econ economists, make an economic analysis without considering that they are in a different field that is moving constantly, not only since 2015, but since 1999. The arrival of COVID-19 and the stage of this global crisis finds a Venezuelan economy which has been declining for six years in a row. The current figures published by the central bank and from the first quarter of 2019 show this. The quarterly rates go over 20% of a fall, 26%. With drastic falls in strategic factors, for example, the manufacturing sector, commercial sector 39.2, construction 34%, transportation 28%, among other sectors. We also had an inflation dynamic which transformed into hyperinflation. This in inflation dynamic includes several structural factors that explain its causes. These causes of inflation are changed by the influence of the variation of the exchange rate. The inflation spiral, which is a feature of hyperinflation processes in Latin America, is also fed from indexation processes, which are generalized and contribute to the propagation of inflation. The dominant sector supported in a banking system, which is mostly private, promoted a capital flight in the last 10 years. And uh, the external financial assets and they have today extraordinary way to, to modify the exchange rate. The, the strategy of the emission of foreign debt with the titles with value in dollars but bought in bolivars uh, was the channel that made it possible for the capital flight. Most of the dollars circulating today in the Venezuelan economy come from this privatization of the, the oil rent by the private sector. During the long uh, period of recession, inflation in Venezuela experienced uh, changes that could be structural. The, we can all also speak about mutation. There was a process of adaptation to the conditions of the country of the last six years. So everything changed in the last six years in a quick fashion, institutional, logic, functioning of the market. Among those changes, we need to stress some of them first. The coexistence, one of the ma main changes is the coexistence of various currencies. At the beginning of 2019, in the territory, there were six currencies, US dollars, pesos, real, euro, and the Guyana dollar, plus the Bolivar, but mainly US dollars. It means that uh, Bolivar was excluded as a way of exchange, although it is used in the banking system. 60% of transactions are done in foreign exchange. In 2020, the dollarization is confirmed. The dollar is not only used as a value reserve, but also 
predominates as a count unit to express prices of the goods and services. Second, major change. Since 2015, there was an increase in cryptocurrency use with Bitcoin, the mining sector also, the, 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 the mining of cryptocurrencies led to the high use of cryptocurrencies. Petro was introduced. However, this has not fulfilled the expectations because it's not been used as is required, so it becomes a reference to the dollar use. Also, it has not contributed in confronting the US dollar as the preeminent, preeminent uh, currency, which was one of the objectives in the creation of the, the Petro. Second, there's been an intensification in the use of electronic payment. Most transactions are digital transactions. Also, the institutional weaknesses of economic bodies to coordinate policies and to increase the uh, power of the state. For example, let's explain the central bank role. So you have an idea of the changes that have occurred and how meaningful they are. International reserves of the central bank are in its lowest level. The economy is flooded by foreign currency. Foreign currencies are in the market. There are no economic statistics. Um, we see generators of macroeconomic information coming from the parallel political uh, power and private sector. Therefore, the central bank, in, bank is not producing any type of statistics. The banking sector became a huge uh, exchange uh, bank. And uh, one of the main changes occurred in the labor market first, a flexibilization of the labor sector, a proliferation of market uh, of labor contract deteriorating the conditions of uh, the, the labor force and uh, whose rights are sacrificed. Second, substantial devaluation of the Bolivar and the, its impact on the inflation. And there has been two main effect, effects. One, a deterioration of wages and salaries and the dramatic drop of uh, household income. Second effect is the widening of uh, inequality and concentration of income. The dominating classes have benefited from this crisis. The middle sector also created mechanism of protection through the use of dollars and another sector of the middle sectors have experienced a, a increased uh, deterioration. Professional sectors in education, healthcare, and key uh, sectors of the for the economy, labor sectors have suffered a, a process of uh, precarization. And third, a profound devaluation led to the reduction of labor costs at level never seen. And this creates the conditions for exploitation of the labor force. Inflation, among other things, expresses the struggle between the owners of the, the means of production. They can set prices while workers are in a weaker situation to set uh, wages. The national government, despite uh, the budget problems, they have deployed a mechanism of protection of uh, the, the, maj the majority sectors. On top of the increase of salaries, there have been social transfers. These transfers distributed through a platform, the Homeland uh, Digital Platform, 
and the, a network of distribution of food boxes through local uh, systems of distribution named CLAP. So people have access to basic uh, food supplies. These initiatives partially have uh, compensated the duration of uh, household income. They are not enough uh, to redress income and improve the situation. Their spe speculation with prices um, are way above those transfer mechanisms. However, these transfer mechanisms and good supply could be the basis for a universal income and uh, the recovery of uh, the wages and salaries. They might become the tools to relaunch the productive dynamic of the country. I've mentioned some of the changes that have occurred in a brief period of time. This mutation that has occurred it is a structural change that no one looked for that occurred spontaneously. Last, we have another change that we need to discuss. How come that because of these chaos and constraints, society and the economy have uh, withstood this terrible situation? The answer is in the streets in the territory, in agricultural producers. Proposals for uh, popular organizations have taken up uh, productive uh, activities. Constraints due to the blockade have generated uh, conditions to, for the recovery of some production and even for uh, the, the replacement of inputs. And this reality is not being analyzed by traditional uh, economic uh, uh, elements, but the uh, uh, goods and services are provided by these communities. Most of the food come from these small producers and uh, the local markets are well supplied because of the work of these uh, agricultural units. Most of the products that you find in the various markets in main cities, they do not come from Mars, they come from our own economy. So this is not ideal, but we need to understand what is going on. The analysis of the economists are blinded by the, the traditional methodology they're using and they're ignoring this parallel economy. This supply stimulated by the fact that they don't have uh, the oil rent to continue importing food uh, has some threats and they are facing some threats because of the situation of the production, transport uh, and the lack of uh, purchasing power of the population. Another way to face the blockades and shortages is the flexibilization of foreign trade. The government, because of these conditions, has tolerated some trade opening. So trade flows are increased within the private sector and because of the purchasing power of the high and medium levels that have foreign currencies. The type of services traded in this sector through duty-free shops that have proliferated in the country in various cities, those goods reproduce the consumption patterns of the developed uh, countries. This opening, however, not only has enabled uh, uh, the, the uh, consumption of this foreign product, but has uh, also supplied essential products such as uh, uh, medicine and others. In this manner, this has uh, uh, mitigated the lack of some items that we had in 16 and 17. Most of the population, however, do not have access to those uh, items because even the dollar is common in some sectors, 
most people do not have the purchasing power to purchase those items. The national government has making efforts to consolidate new um, trade uh, relations with the South, especially with the, the emerging blocs such as uh, Iran, China, and Russia. The arrival of the Iranian uh, bank uh, tanker with oil, with uh, gasoline, is a, a major landmark consolidating a strategy started that started in the first year of Chavez, namely the strategy to promote a pre poorer world. Regarding the oil sector, the challenge is to recover production and the, the reinvigoration of the oil sector in the country to reinvigorating the, the processing of oil. So oil not only should improve production to export, but also to produce the byproducts that the economy requires. We need to define the industrialization while the small sector is key for the fabric of society. We are in a very heterogeneous situation where we have various forces that are intertwined in the way to produce and consume. We have the large and small sectors, the, the um, free tax shops, the commune sectors, and so on and so forth. Various sectors of the economy, therefore. The scenarios are very varied. What are the alternatives that we have? Well, one of those with more probability of occurring is the consolidation of international insertion based on cooperation, based on the exploitation of the mining sector and energy sector. The second, a change of the production matrix to produce a change in the energy matrix, technological matrix, and the consumption matrix. This is far more complex and requires people's participation because it is based in the promotion of social relations based on the communal sector. However, it is not an alternative that you find in the theory. It's been developed already in progressively and with some constraints in the Venezuelan economic uh, uh, sector. In the production of food enables to combine uh, health sector, um, the, the food sector, the promotion of better, harmonious, uh, alternative uh, economic relations different from the one of the capitalist industrialization. The capitalist crisis and the pandemic and the, the meltdown of the capitalist dependent economic sector offers new opportunities. The pandemic could trigger a change in the capitalistic sector and also can give a new characteristic to our economy because uh, the labor place has changed and there will be although also although changes after the pandemic changes imposed by healthcare and the way the productive sector will be the restructure it is an opportunity to replace some of the important items with the national items. It's time to promote the local human scale economy, regional economy based on the principles of sovereignty and uh, sustainable productive mechanisms, stressing the popular participation. I apologize for my long presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot to also Felix for this online in presentation i think that uh, uh not not i think that happily it was not stalin the thing that he said actually uh, jose, felix, jose felix could go, go deepen in the multiple crisis situation uh, at this moment in venezuela but also explain every different aspects on it so i think that's quite important and can give a, a, an important general overview in order to advance in the different uh, 
next presentations. Now we will have our our friend Anna Felician, which is a sovereignty food uh, researcher from the uh, Venezuelan Institute for for Science. Uh, she has been uh, uh, specialized in seed studies and food sovereignty and different packs. She's also part, she's also activist of a people to people's network, El Plan Pueblo Pueblo. So, and she has been also a promoter of the, of the current law for the seed protection and go uh, against the, the modified uh, uh, genetically uh, seeds. So uh, let's go now with the presentation from Anna. And I want to share some elements from the past and present of the Venezuelan food system. Okay, okay. Uh -huh. I want to share some elements from the past and present uh, of the Venezuelan food system, which allow us to discuss the so-called food crisis. No? And... Okay, it's stuck. No, no importa. Sí, sí. Okay, okay, la siguiente. La siguiente, no, okay. Well, I, I want to make a statement here, no? The, the approach used in this work, in this work is from an academic and activist perspective and the context the content of this presentation was prepared based on the diverse, on diverse sources, such as a research in process about food sovereignty in Venezuela and an experience of as food sovereignty activists involved in diverse grassroots efforts since the last 10 years. And so the discussion present here is oriented to bring some elements for the complex debate about food sovereignty, not just in Venezuela, but in, from a Venezuelan perspective. Ah, are you listened? Sí? Okay, perfect. La siguiente, no. Okay. And for this uh, um, work, we also take the food sovereignty concept from the Nieleni Ni Declaration, no? of the 2007 and where we define the food sovereignty as the right of the peoples to healthy and culturally appropriated food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and the right to uh, English is not working ah, uh, there's people with the English channel open it no we we have to stop some people, ah, okay. Some people is saying that they don't have the access to the English channel. Okay. Okay. Well, the food sovereignty concept, no, based on this declaration of Nieleni from 2007. Well, we understand the food sovereignty firstly as a right, no, of the peoples to this healthy food and culturally appropriated food, produced ecologically and sus by sustainable methods and the right to define their own food and agricultural systems. In Venezuela, we, we have to, to put this concept in our conditions. Venezuela is one of the seven, 17 mega diverse countries in the world. And also, as the previous speaker said, we have the largest oil reserve in the world and has been an oil producer since uh, the beginning of the okay, <laughs> the beginning of the 20th century, and uh, food sovereignty is situated in this context of strong tensions emerging from the nature-society relations determined by our colonial and neo-colonial forces. The next, please. Uh -huh. sí. No, la plaza anterior. Uh -huh. So in this context, we as generation inherit a food system determined by a 
highly monopolized by corporations, uh, empresas polares, controls around the 60% of the production of the most consumed food, the pre-cooked corn flour. Uh, our food system has a strongly segregated structure, agroindustry in one hand, and, the, and large farmers occupy the majority of agricultural land and receive the majority of credits, imported inputs, distribution channels, control the majority of distribution channels and infrastructure. And in the other hand, we have the um, peasant and Afro-descendant and indigenous farming um, who control and conserve the, our majority of the agrobiodiversity and also if they have less access to land and have no access to credit and other resources. And finally, our consumption patterns are determined by urban food waste, dependent on imported and processed foods, even in the countryside, not just in the cities. Uh -huh. So to show these tensions, we, we bring two figures to synthesize, synthesize <laughs> this, this, this location of the production and consumption. A la primera. In relation with the, for example, in relation with the agricultural surface, uh, we elaborate here the, this figure, uh, putting the main uh, crops produced in the country. We have uh, in the upper part of the graph the distribution of the crops, no, grouped by cereals, vegetables, legumes tubers and fruits and other traditional crops. The blue part of the circle is represented by cereals, no? which accounts for the most part of the agricultural surface, around 80%. 80, 80, 80%. <laughs> this is a class of uh, numbers in English, sorry. 80% uh, of the national agricultural surface bond with but when, when we see the yields, the average yields of these crops in the down part of the graph, mm -hmm, we see that the cereals are uh, very weak. Okay. Ah, que la voz va y viene. Ah, okay. Boy, uh, uh, I will try to speak louder. <laughs> Uh -huh. The cereals are the, the group of the cereals which occupy the most part of the agricultural lands are the, 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 the group of the crops which have the, the, um, the minor uh, average production, ranging to 2,000 and 40,000 kilos per hectare compared to the, our traditional foods, our traditional crops in purple, as you can see, um, uh, cassava, uh, potato, uh, uh, sweet potato, also which accounts for the 4% of the agricultural surface, but, but have the highest yield um, average. And also it's important to say that these crops, traditional crops, which are, have an, an, or, an indigenous origin are also, I say, under the peasant control, indigenous control, and the seed and all the technology is, uh, is uh, located and is uh, managed by these communities. The second, la siguiente. In the other side, related with the evolution of our consumption pattern, we can use also the corn, spe specifically the, the corn flour, uh, consumption and the revolution of the consumption since the uh, emergence of the corn flour processed corn flour by the agro industry no that was in um, in the 60s in the 70s i don't know in the in the 70s in the 70s mm -hmm. so we have in this graph the total consumption of corn in the 70s, uh, it was around 35 kilos per person per day, and the, only the 30% of this consumption was uh, uh, represented by pre-cooked flour. 
only 10, 30 years later, the pre-cooked corn flour occupied the 88% of our consumption, the 88% of our, uh, of the consumption of the main food uh, consumed in the country is controlled by Empresa Polar and the large and agro-industry sector dependent on the, on the importations. Mm -hmm. That's the end. So this, this shows how the monopolization expressed not just in the agricultural lands, but also in our, even in our own bodies um, through the, our food waste. And from, uh, in response to that, uh, the, the, the Bolivarian Revolution uh, developed an important, important agenda for food sovereignty and agroecology, and agroecology during the last 20 years. E, well, we can say a lot of that, but we just bring a list, a very brief list of the main policies related with the food sovereignty and agroecology and uh, designed and implemented from, from above. No? As we said, we have land reform, we, have, we had a national seed plan, we had a national network for laboratories of biological inputs, 29 laboratories across the country. We have a national public network for food distribution oriented to working class people called Mercal, Pedeval, um, among others. Financial programs for small farmers. National programs for transfer food habits through the National School for Nutrition. And also uh, dining rooms uh, or something like that called Casas de Alimentación. Recently, the main uh, food policy is the local provisioning and production committees, but all these efforts uh, did not break with the import dependency, did not break with monopolization of food system. So after all these efforts, we, this condition, the previous condition of of monopolization and import dependency created the condition for the weaponization of food. So we can see some images that the, the, of this, the result of the main results of this agenda, no? Uh, related with production, la de arriba, la, ajá, la foto un poco. Uh, the production of uh, biological inputs, distribution of food, um, working on in the schools with the school feeding programs and so on. But now in the middle of the, what is called crisis, we can see a trend of food weaponization, specifically from 2014, 15 until now. This food weaponization began with the hoarding of the most consumed food, especially the precooked corn flour, hoarding uh, resulting in long lines and the supermarkets across the country, which was publicized by the mainstream media across the world. After that, the strategy has been induced speculation of food prices and throughout the supply chain, including for all the very basic agricultural tools and inputs. At the same time, sanctions impo imposed by the U.S. and its allies have hampered importation of food, medicines, and agricultural goods. And the last year, when USA tried to force the so-called food aid throughout our borders, aid that paid the comparison to how much revenue the country was losing due to sanctions and blockades. So this phenomenon of food weaponization is affecting the everyday life of the people. And uh -huh, um, in the middle of all these uh, scenario, we also have two global issues in this complex sense. Uh, in one hand, we have the, all the impacts no, of the climate change that you have been discussed in the, during these days, and uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. In relation to climate change, uh, in, in relation to climate change, as uh, Hernan said at the beginning, Venezuela contributes only with the 0 40, 49 percent of the global emissions, Princip mainly related with the energy and transport sectors, and 
some of the projected impacts in agriculture are bueno, the reduction of yield, specifically for corn, rice, black beans, sugar cane. Uh, again, the cereals. Know, are uh, are very vulnerable to these in these scenarios and other imports impacts that we have been recorded in the field works are changes in the rainfall patterns unexpected droughts and in brief we can say that adaptation to climate change impacts must be a priority in food sovereignty agenda considering the vulnerability to climate change as the result of the convergence of multiple stressors, climatic, but also non-climatic. In relation to COVID, by yesterday, July 15, we have 10,428 total cases, and we are in social quarantine declared by the president since March 17. Among the economic and social measures, uh, implemented range from mandatory use of face masks, launch a healthy health survey, international alliances for health, Ed, and in the middle of this COVID emergency, the unilateral coercive measures have are intensified. In front of the, all that, yeah, we have also the responses from below, no? In, Specifically here, I will talk about the food sovereignty from below. Very briefly, we have a lot of effort related with seed production and national distribution of these seeds, especially in potato by Proimpa and grassroots organization of peasants in the Andean region, and also with the uh, seed producers in the Eastern region, Guanape. Also, we have efforts. Uh, addressing the planning of food production, distribution, and consumption according to food needs, needs, not according to market uh, dynamics. Connecting rural and urban grassroots organizations, no? as the experience of the Plan Pueblo Pueblo. And also, uh, the grassroots organizations are occupying public food policies, especially the national school feeding program as the experience of the Plan Pueblo Pueblo. And one is uh, a strategy which is key in this adaptation to climate change is the diversification of agricultural systems to include traditional crops and to reduce the climate risks and provide to local food to the local community. All these efforts are uh, based in two key premises that we, we see no, as the Venezuelan keys for food sovereignty construction. One is go to work toward a zero dollar agriculture as Rafael Romero from Proimpa said and defend the food as a human right and not for profit as is the main premise of the plan Pueblo a Pueblo. La siguiente. A concrete example about this uh, importance is the experience of the plan Pueblo a Pueblo during the the quarantine. The 30 peasant families have produced 105,665 kilos of fresh vegetables, vegetables and fruits distributed to 32,858 families that, and have fed 13,232 children through the National School Feeding Program supported by now for these grassroots uh, efforts and the peasant agriculture. As we see in the picture, we have in one hand the production side of the plant Pueblo Pueblo. And on the final image, we can see the organ grassroots organizations in the city, the uh, responsible for the distribution of food in communities and also in schools. So, mm -hmm. Finish. <laughs> we just put some challenges, just few ones, no? uh, for this uh, food sovereignty agenda from below, including race, gender, and decolonial perspective is the main challenge, which allows reconnect our food system to our biocultural diversity, 
increase the dispute for public policies in favor of peasant, indigenous, and Afro communities, which have the knowledge and the technologies which has, which have been feeding off in the last years. Connect these efforts with other international and transnational initiatives like La Via Campesina Seed Campaign, Solidarity with Palestine, and other um, grassroots organizations in this uh, global level. And also generate our own indicators, information, and data, as said the previous speaker, is important. Even in the state, most for us that we, we does, doesn't exist, we don't exist in the, in the conventional narrative of economic uh, and knowledge production. So at the end, at the very end, we need to understand the nature and the long-term food weaponization, the nature of the long-term food weaponization process based on white supremacy, patriarchy, and extinction of nature as three, three main I don't know, <laughs> three, three main uh, forces that determine all the aggressions against Venezuela and our food system. Thank you. Thank you very much to Anna for this uh, enlightening presentation. It talks about uh, different issues and food sovereignty right now in Venezuela. Uh, most of the struggles, most of the responses from the grassroots, but also the current situation of dependency and, and in, in food matters, uh, also the strategies of uh, resistance from the government, but also from the uh, autonomous organizations, and of course, with uh, very interesting challenges. Uh, now, we are going forward with our friend Juan Carlos Rodriguez, which is militant from El Movimiento de Pobladoras y Pobladores, which is something like Urban Settlers Movement, uh, also a coordinator of the political uh, board of Campamento de Pioneros, which is a national organization, part of this platform, and he's also architect and teacher at Venezuela Bolivarian University. Saludos a todos y todas. Acá en Venezuela, los organizadores de esta actividad, por invitarnos, para compartir un poco la, la visión desde el movimiento popular. Y un saludo allá al otro lado del mundo a todos los compañeros, compañeras que nos están eh, escuchando. Un placer poder transmitir desde Venezuela nuestras ideas a ese foro sur-sur que están llevando ustedes a cabo. ¿no? Nos parece importante porque creo que hay visiones que nosotros estamos construyendo desde este lado del mundo que eh, coinciden con algunos de los planteamientos que se han venido haciendo en este foro. ¿no? Bueno, no, nuestra intervención es fundamentalmente una intervención desde el movimiento popular, ¿no? una intervención tanto desde eh, académica, de investigación, pero con mucha coincidencia con lo que se ha venido planteando en las intervenciones anteriores. ¿no? Primero sería ver cómo estamos nosotros viendo el momento actual y nosotros para, digamos, resumirlo en términos generales, eh, nosotros planteamos que en Venezuela estamos viviendo un colapso de la modernidad rentista, petrolera, de cómo se configuró eh, ese modelo civilizatorio, ese proyecto civilizatorio acá en Venezuela. ¿no? Entonces lo que estamos viendo es un colapso de esa modernidad. Yo no voy a extender en qué se traduce ese colapso en términos económicos, porque el compañero José Félix ya planteó algunos elementos, algunos no, bastante elementos, de cómo ese colapso se traduce en el campo de la economía. Si quisiera puntualizar alguna, algunas cosas, ¿no? Lo primero, el tema de la moneda. El colapso de la moneda es un colapso, es el colapso, es, es muy simbólico, no solamente tiene impacto en términos económicos, sino que tiene impacto en términos simbólicos de lo que para los estados-nación modernos significa la emisión y el control de la moneda. ¿no? Eso es un elemento central. Destruir la moneda eh, apunta a la destrucción del Estado-Nación moderno. ¿no? Eh. And this is an element that we need to bear in mind when we discuss the collapse of the, the oil rent modernity uh, system. 
a collapse resulting from the blockade, the harassment, the bullying. It is not a spontaneous collapse. It is being provoked by foreign actions, the harassment and the bullying and the aggression. Now, this collapse has economic effects, but also political effects. Daily, we see how the classic mediation systems are collapsed in the country. The liberal democracy start collapsing in the interaction among parties, political parties, political parties lose sense. They are meaningless today. People are not, uh, do not feel represented by the political parties. They are not key elements in the political life of the, of the country. This collapse is also, also translates in the subjectivity of the people. We see a subjectivity which is more liberal in society that were in the past was uh, over, overcame. So there is a collapse in services. The modern way of uh, life has been destroyed. We in the urban centers, in the capital, we see the collapse of services and the urban life is being collapsed progressively and it is difficult to sustain from the uh, logic of oil rent, of rentierism. So just to give you an overview of uh, the situation from our perspective of the popular grassroots and from a decolonizing perspective, what is in crisis is not Chavismo. What is in crisis is not the government. What is in crisis is the, the oil rent modernity system in Venezuela. And the Bolivarian government is dealing with this collapse and it is the cost collapse in order to uh, install the idea of a failed state and therefore impose another government. To say that the Bolivarian government is collapsed, this is a failed state, therefore we need to have a colonial government instead. And Jose Felis mentioned this already. The purpose is to recolonize Venezuela, to reinstall a sort of uh, protectorate in Venezuela. And various comments made uh, by the uh, spokespersons from the US government and journalists, well, that seemed to be the idea they have. Venezuela is part and parcel of the influence area, the first area of influence of the US, it is almost uh, as another state of the U.S. and it has to be controlled, therefore, by the U.S. administration. And this is very clear to us in this moment. This collapse is having an impact in the people and grassroots movements because the limitation of uh, resources to live there's been uh, an impoverishment of the people. And Jose Félix gave some figures which are horrendous because they translate into an impoverishment of uh, the people. They cannot uh, uh, live. There are less capacities to live from the modern standpoint. Now, at the same time, we see the resurgence of new ways to reproduce life. And that's uh, an element I'd like to stress. The dilemma we are facing 
in Venezuela and the Bolivarian Revolution as a whole, is that faced with this collapse of the rent uh, system modernity, that it's no longer possible to sustain this type of rent system, although we, we insist that we need to continue increasing the oil production without going back to the reproduction of the rentier model, faced with this collapse in general, politics is devoted to sustain modernity, not through rent, rentierism, but through other type of uh, rent, another type of distribution of the rent. In this occasion, it is the foreign exchange rent accumulated by the uh, private sector in Venezuela. So now, in general, in the Venezuelan economy, we see the preservation of uh, the rent reason, but not through oil income, but uh, this time through uh, international sources of foreign invest, of foreign foreign exchange, um, the use of foreign exchange used by the private sector, who are now importing the money they uh, they uh, exported in the past. So this is a contradiction in terms because what truly matters today is to foster economic, social, political forms, enabling us to overcome not rentierism, but modernity as such, to overcome rentierism and modernity as a civilization project. Because otherwise, there will be a trap to try to preserve a system, a model, of development based on modernity that uh, eventually is challenging the planet and generating the climate crisis. Capitalism is in a crisis. The, it's not in crisis, sorry. And civilization model is not in crisis, but it, they are created creating a crisis for the planet, for the reproduction of life and human life in general, and it has an impact on the reproduction of life in the planet. In the planet. And there we agree with some brothers and sisters who are proposing that with this in crisis is not the civilization model, but life itself, because this civilization model is jeopardizing life as such. Therefore, in this context of the pandemic of the pandemic, we need to go deep in this because it's been said that the pandemic generated a crisis of the capitalism and modernity. However, I think capitalism has been able to overcome the, the global pandemic and uh, it is most probably probable that capitalism is going to prevail at the end of the pandemic with more wealth. However, the pandemic has revealed the misery, exclusion of generated by the system. It has visibilized the effects of uh, this uh, civilization uh, uh, model based on modernity. So this is a trap in Venezuela. The vision that you may have from China and from Asia would be interesting for us to debate because it can be a different vision. Here in Latin America in general terms, we have been talking about the need to transcend modernity, to transcend the civilization project of the West and go towards a different civilization horizon. And this is something that we could discuss with you. Later, we will have uh, some interventions, so maybe we could talk about this, because we consider that this civilization model is a, a model of death. 
this is not a model of life. So we need to transcend that. So for us in Latin America, within the area of direct influence of American imperialism, we have a double challenge. On the one hand, we cannot let them impose these new ways of colonial protectorates that they want to impose in the whole of Latin America. And on the other hand, we need to build a new alternative of civilization in order to overcome this colonial behavior, because even if we challenge the logic of the capital, we do not challenge modernity as a civilization project. So within the economic projects, the social projects and the political projects, and within this framework, we need to create a new civilization project. But there, that is where we have a trap because what we need to fight against is that civilization model that I described that causes all the effects that we can see today. So from the grassroots movements, where do we go? By the way, these uh, movements, we need to talk about the translation of this movement because there are two categories that imply completely different things. So I am talking, I'm going to talk about this problem of translation because the translation would be settlers in English. Pobladores in Spanish would be settlers in English. I don't know in Chinese. It would be interesting to see what the word is in Chinese because we are trying to build a new category of a subject of an individual. This is the individual that is also a settler. So if we talk about the translation, sometimes it is translated as settlement, but this implies a colonies, a, a colonization action. But we are an urban individual that is fighting against the colonizing logic. It fights again th against the urban model imposed by modernity. And it tries to recover its capacity to inhabit and to build its environment, its way of life. And we also have inhabitants. That is another word that is used to describe settlers. And this will be closer to what we do. As a movement, we want to change our city to build a new model of city from a from a communal point of view, from a logic in which we recover the capacity of the human being to inhabit an area. That is a fundamental aspect for us of recovery. And for this, we need to have a new way of production in the space, a new way of planning in the space that includes the community. So we are going to dispute the city. We are going to plan, we are going to think, we are going to produce and inhabit from the communal point of view, from a community point of view. So this is what we want to build from the different fronts of organizations that are included in the settlers movement. This is a movement for the dispute of this modern project of the colonial city. And we have been working on this for almost for 14 years of struggle within our organization. In this moment, we are seeing that these ways of organization that have been consolidated within the framework of the Bolivarian Revolution in the past 20 years have been able to really sustain the resistance in the face of imperialist aggression. I think that in the face of this imperialist aggression, of this collapse, collapse of uh, this rent system in Venezuela, we need to ask ourselves, what is really holding us together. And I think we need to 
include two things. First, all of the ways of organization, such as communal councils, all of the ways of community organization, and they are expressed in every area, in every field. For example, we just saw the expression of communal organization from agricultural production, from the field, from the countryside. And we have other colleagues that also work in that area. So we have been able to resist this collapse and these aggressions are all these ways of organization consolidated and built during the years of the Bolivarian Revolution. And on the other hand, we have a subjectivity. The government of President Nicolás Maduro has made a great deal of effort to be able to sustain the revolution, to be able to resist the aggressions and the collapse. So all of those mechanisms, as Jose Felix even talked about in numbers and figures, are not enough. So what is sustaining us? We have a completely liberalized society. In a liberalized society, we, we would have overcome this. So why can we continue to progress? because this isn't only a position of resistance, but also of offensive, because we are building progressively every single day. And from our experience, that subjectivity of the communities is what keeps us standing and building every day. In the midst of the situation, Jose Felix talked about uh, around 80% of fall of the construction sector in Venezuela. But in the midst of this situation, and with very limited resources and very limited investments, we keep building, we keep building houses for people. And we can only do this because of the organizations that we have and that we have strengthened for over a decade. And within this context, what has allowed us to contain the pandemic or uh, not to propagate it so quickly as in other Latin American countries has been the popular organizations, the grassroots movements, because thanks to these movements, we have established these massive detection systems and testing systems and this has helped us control the propagation of the pandemic here in Venezuela. Obviously, we have a political approach in this case for the protection of the population. But all of these government policies are only, po are only possible thanks to the people organization. Without this organization, we wouldn't be able to solve food problems with CLAP. This would not work without the organization of the people. So all of the policies to combat COVID-19 is also possible thanks to the organization of the people that is behind the Venezuelan healthcare system if we didn't have the small peasants, the small producers, we wouldn't be able to eat anything. We wouldn't be able to produce because the Venezuelan agro industry collapsed. This is part of the collapse of modernity. We have a collapse in the industry of construction, of agriculture. We have a co collapse in the whole modern industrial system. That is why I think it's important to debate what is the best project to establish in the future, because this is going to define our possibilities of success and the final victory. So this is our core idea, but this implies 
to overcome a contradiction or a debate between private or public because the pandemic has also brought to the front for, forefront the privatization of the healthcare system, which were not able to resolve the crisis generated by the pandemic. So sometimes we have to go back to the public healthcare system. We need to come back to those public systems and we are in agreement because the public healthcare system's response has been much more effective than in the private system. But we also need to go to communal systems, including the healthcare area, because the pandemic demonstrated the limitations of the modern healthcare system in order to provide health care to most of the population. So regardless of uh, whether we use a public or private system, the question is if a centralized healthcare system is going to be able to provide health care to everyone in the country, to those who are excluded from the system, because the people who are dying in the United States because of the pandemic are not the rich people, they are poor people. And that is what's happening in, the, in Latin America and in many parts of the world. The marginalized, the disenfranchised, the elderly, poor people are the ones who are dying from this pandemic. So we need to challenge these centralized modern systems. And this discussion about the public and the private sector is always based upon denying the communal. Because there is a subjectivity of modernity, as I said before. Modernity is not only genocide, because it destroys the possibility of life, but also it destroys the community. It kills the community. That is why it's a genocide, because the only way, the only way the human being can live is in a community. And when we destroy or when we deny that communality as a way of social organization for the reproduction of life, we destroy the life of the human beings. <sighs> So from uh, the left wing, we address the discussion about this project, about the civilization project, which in this case is modernity, and how we can build from the academia, from intellectuality, an alternative, a communal alternative to this civilization project, and from our daily struggle. But for this, we need to overcome the modern vision that we only have the public and private sector. We see the discussion in Venezuela every single day. They never talk about the, co the commune, of the communal aspect. They only talk about the private or the public. But the communal do not only exists, but in the midst of a blockade, in the midst of harassment, and in the midst of a pandemic, it makes possible the capacity to resist. So how can we destroy the myth of modernity? How can we construct a new subjectivity? Decolonized, that overcomes the subjectivity, the modern subjectivity, that is the one that predominates nowadays. So this is our main challenge. I talked about this before, but I wanted to just bring it to the table now. So thank you, Hernan. Thank you very much to Juan Carlos, uh, who actually has uh, contributed to this whole picture that we have been building with the different uh, presentations, uh, specifically 
uh, reading the the current crisis as a crisis of the collapse of the colonial modern modern Western uh, system. So in that in that matter, he actually proposed uh, different ways to read that, and from there read the actual uh, moment in Venezuela as a dispute from the communal uh, possibilities, from the communal uh, uh, process. Uh, and then that's between that possibility of building the communal wave, which actually has been represented here, against the possibility of restructure the neoliberal and, and, and modern Western system, colonial system. So now we're going to our next presentation, which is with our uh, friend Mariana Garcia Soho, which is political scientist, researcher, and feminist activist, specializing in sexual and reproductive rights of women and girls. She's also militant of Faldas R, a feminist organization that provides women and girls with sexual education, birth control methods, and access to safe abortion. So please, Mariana. Well, hello, all. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Kim Chi and the whole team at, uh, at Lingnam University for organizing this, this uh, fundamental space that is uh, the South-South Forum. Uh, that is crucial to generate an open global dialogue on alternatives uh, to sustain life, not just beyond the overlapping crises, but beyond capitalism as well. And also, thank you all for, for being in this forum and taking an interest in understanding a bit more about this, this very complex situation that Venezuela is in. Um, so the, the triple trap, as we've been calling it in the forum, uh, the economic downturn, climate change, and pandemic, found Venezuela in a situation of, of great political complexity, but above all, of great vulnerability with, uh, with weakened institutions and a decadent infrastructure and an impoverished population that has few alternatives to sustain itself outside of the limits of the state's protection. Uh, a state that's been crippled by sanctions and oil dependency like uh, the interventions before me have, um, have analyzed. Uh, women, being one of the social groups that is most exploited in capitalism, of course, live these multiple overlapping crises in particular ways. So to characterize how the situation is lived from Venezuela, I would like to divide this intervention into three parts. Uh, first of all, I would like to take a look at the situation of uh, certain fundamental human rights uh, that are particularly indicative of women's general situation in any given society. Uh, then I would like to discuss uh, some of the strategies of social organizations that seek to uh, placate uh, some of the situation as well as fight to achieve structural changes. And finally, I would like to make a brief commentary on some of the challenges and impossibilities in this pandemic crisis-ridden horizon. With respect to the situation of, of certain, certain fundamental human rights uh, for women in the country, it is inevitably necessary to start by looking at the situation of maternal mortality or maternal death. Uh, this indicator gives us an overview of inequity in any society because it reflects access to multiple fundamental rights, not only uh, the right to life itself, but also to the self-determination over one's own body, to relevant and timely information, to health infrastructure and services, even to mobility, because uh, without proper access to mobility when presenting dangerous symptoms during pregnancy or labor, the probability of maternal death intensifies. In Venezuela, uh, maternal mortality is one of the highest in the region. Uh, we have no official data on this issue since 2016, after the country suffered a terrifying 66% increase of maternal mortality uh, during 2015. Uh, since 2017, in response, the state has been promoting a policy for respected birth, it's what it's called, which focuses on training women of popular sectors to provide counsel and accompaniment, much like doulas, 
to other women uh, of their communities uh, during their pregnancies and until they give birth. While I personally consider this policy to be of great help and great potential, I do not think it addresses key issues of maternal mortality, such as the lack of medical materials and equipment in, in health centers needed to provide proper health care to women who are undergoing labor. It also doesn't address the multiple reasons why women, especially the most vulnerable ones economically, cannot follow through with prenatal medical care. Uh, in this sense, uh, so far in 2020, there is no indication that this rising trend in maternal mortality has uh, changed or decreased, um, much less in the face of the COVID pandemic, which has taken over the already reduced capacity of our health infrastructure. Uh, so this is very much still a, a, an, an issue to be highly concerned about from a feminist perspective. On the other hand, if we look at the situation of access to contraceptive methods, uh, we see that this has been quite precarious since before the pandemic. Um, according to a recent survey conducted by an NGO, 55% uh, of the respondents, which were around 500 adolescents and young women, 55% uh, of them uh, indicated that they purchased their preferred method of contraception, from ph pharmacies and health centers. However, 43% indicated that they cannot access them normally because of difficulties uh, associated with the quarantine, namely difficulties in mobility and most of all difficulties in pain for these contraceptive methods. Um, it's, it's important to note that according to another social organization, the average price of the monthly contraceptive pill in July, 2020, is around $9, while minimum wage in, in Venezuela is just under $5. So it is clear that contraceptive methods have become a luxury item for any woman who earns well any income equal or even twice as much as minimum wage. Uh, incidentally, 91% of the women who were surveyed agreed that the state should create a specific policy for, uh, for family planning during the COVID pandemic. And most of them proposed that the state should massively distri distribute contraceptive methods as it used to be its policy. Uh, we don't currently know the volume of the state's supply in contraceptives, but we do know that the last massive purchase of, birth of contraceptive methods it did was in 2015. On the other hand, I think it is also key to look at access to safe abortion because this is an indicator uh, of the tangible possibilities women have to exercise sexual and reproductive autonomy. Uh, in Venezuela, abortion is almost completely criminalized except uh, in, in the case, uh, except when the life of the mother is in danger. That is the only grounds. Uh, this is one of the most restrict restrictive legal contexts in all of Latin America and the Caribbean. In fact, it's the most restrictive context in South America, along with Paraguay. Uh, so in addition to this uh, significant legal debt that the Bolivarian process has with Venezuelan women, we also do not have uh, official data that reflects the situation of abortion in the country. Although we do know that at least 10% at least of maternal death uh, response to unsafe abortions. Thanks to data collected by organizations that monitor Venezuelans women, Venezuelan women's access to safe abortion, we know that between March and June of 2020, which is the, the, the quarantine period, uh, there has been an upsurge in abortion cases registered by these organizations, as well as cases of sexual violence resulting in unwanted pregnancies. So we have reason to believe that quarantine has meant a deepening in the vulnerability of sexual and reproductive autonomy for, for women in Venezuela, much like in the rest of the global south. Now looking outside of sexual and reproductive rights and more towards economic rights, another aspect that is generally indicative of the, of the situation of women in any given society is the situation of reproductive and care work. Uh, in Venezuela, there is a sustained trend of increasing numbers of female heads of household. Uh, in fact, it was almost 40% of households by 2011, according to official information. 
Uh, and according to unofficial recently published information, this number could be as high as 72% in 2019. So at the same time, according to uh, official data, since 2015, uh, there is a very strong trend towards a reduction of women's presence in the economically active population and simultaneously an increase in economically inactive population who is exclusively dedicated to housework uh, or domestic work, which, I mean, it's noteworthy that this population is considered economically inactive by the Venezuelan state. Um, in fact, according to unofficial data, as few as four out of 10 women participate in the labor market today compared to seven out of 10 men. So this data reveals a sustained trend in expanding inequity in Venezuela uh, and an increasingly scarce equitable distribution of reproductive work in our society because of the triple crisis. On the other hand, as a direct consequence of the massive migration phenomenon that Venezuela has been experiencing in the last few years, uh, a lot of the weight of reproductive and domestic work produced by the absence of mothers and fathers uh, is falling on female figures of the household, especially grandmothers, aunts, and worryingly, oldest daughters and sons. The last uh, of these uh, human rights issues that I would like to look at is the number of femicides and the quality of access to justice. Uh, in the sense, again, there are no uh, official figures to cite since 2016, but fortunately there are social organizations making significant efforts to shed light on these circumstances. Um, according to one of the main unofficial femicide observatories, June, December, and January have proven to be the most deadliest months for women in Venezuela between 2011 and 2020. The most common perpetrators of femicide in 2019 were partners, fam family members, and former partners in that order. Another observatory indicated that 75% of femicides that occurred between March and June of 2020 in the pandemic period occurred in the woman's home. So these facts must make us alert and very worried about what may be happening right now during quarantine especially while women and girls are forced to remain confined in their homes with potentially violent partners or family members. On the other hand, although many organizations have been denouncing high rates of impunity surrounding, surrounding genders associated with gender-based violence, uh, one of the observatories that I previously cited mentions that uh, in 2019, 42% of perpetrators were prosecuted. So this is a positive response from the state, even if it is still insufficient. Now, in the face of this very turbulent outlook, um, there is a fabric of social organizations that insist on defending uh, a dignified life for women and girls in Venezuela, deploying multiple strategies, even amidst significant logistical obstacles. Uh, there is a long and expanding list of, of groups and collectives and organizations and organized communities that are dedicated to the counseling and accompaniment of women that are experiencing situations of violence uh, or providing and distributing contraception and self-administered abortions, among many others. Uh, many of these organizations also contribute to clarifying the reality of women in Venezuela by collecting, processing, and publishing um, data on the areas that we discussed, which has proven extremely useful in absence of official information. In addition, and perhaps most importantly, uh, these past two decades of the Bolivarian process have left an extensive network of popular organizations at a grassroots level all over the country, composed primarily of women and focused on guaranteeing the reproduction of life for their communities, even in very precarious contexts. So like the previous interventions uh, before me pointed out, this may very well be a key uh, of our people's ability to withstand the multiple overlapping crises for so long. Finally, uh, I mean, we know that like in any crisis, this triple trap contains within itself the seeds of an uncertain future. Uh, our mission as militants of uh, a dignified life for the majority is precisely to make sure that this other future is one of greater dignity and autonomy for women. 
In this sense, it is worth trying to identify some possibilities in this pandemic horizon of overlapping crisis, which, of course, these possibilities will not materialize uh, if we do not fight for them, no matter how many allies we have within the state. So I'd like to point out at least three general uh, challenges in this sense. First of all, I believe it is possible that this reaccumulation of reproductive and care work that we are currently experimenting translates into a recognition and appreciation of this work as productive work by the state and by communities so that it is redistributed beyond the female figures of the home, ideally through cultural change as well as public policy. Also, uh, it is very important that we demand that the state incorporates a gender perspective in its policy for managing the crisis of COVID-19 by devising a national plan to protect women and girls from gender-based violence. This would imply any number of things, but it could include things that could be as simple as implementing measures to allow women to report gender-based crimes remotely through hotlines or internet platforms, etc. Uh, as well as measures to expedite institutional response to such reports. And lastly, measures that are coordinated with the efforts of social reproduction, uh, social organizations, I'm sorry, uh, in order to amplify the state's reach at a grassroots level. And lastly, it is very, it is extremely urgent that we assume collectively that sexual and reproductive health of women is a priority in the management of the crisis. Uh, this implies many things, but I believe there are at least three issues that cannot be postponed and that require urgent attention from the state. First of all, that the state should resupply itself uh, with contraceptive methods and redistribute them massively, as it once did. Secondly, uh, that significant resources should be focused on guaranteeing health equipment and materials to uh, reduce maternal death numbers. And finally, but also extremely important, we need to legalize abortion, at least in some of the most um, sensitive grounds, so that women uh, can exercise sexual autonomy. These grounds are mental health, uh, the grounds of rape, and the grounds of poverty. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mariana, uh, for this really important presentation, which actually kind of uh, uh, complement like a whole diverse overview of the current situation in Venezuela, but not as an static picture, instead of a dynamic process of different kind of disputes. I uh, want to open the floor for some questions uh, and comments, but also uh, I, I want to introduce that, that questioning uh, with some emphasis in, the, in, the, in some of the trying to uh, give a capital emphasis in some of the, in a summary of the panel. I think it's important to see that from the beginning with this situation of multiple crises that has been characterized by Jose Felix, uh, where you can also see the other side that it's about uh, a lot of kind of resistances, uh, like for the rural land, uh, which is in a country where you have a high monopolized uh, 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 mode of production uh, for food, but also uh, a, a pattern of consumption, which is also dependent, but in the other way you have like a lot of process of rural production from agriculture, and peasant, uh, family and peasant uh, agriculture. Uh, but in the other hand, you have this, this uh, uh, contribution from Juan Carlos who speaks about uh, the whole kind of communal ways that are part of an alternative against this uh, collapse of the uh, colonial modern model, uh, all interdependent in Venezuela. And also this, this uh, point of view from the different uh, challenges in the in the human uh, in the women rights uh, uh, issue that kind of give us different challenges that that was summarized by Mariana in the last one, I, I maybe could add some numbers that could be important for for add to this kind of dispute because 
maybe as you can see in this panel, we are actually proposing that in the middle of this crisis, the difference in a very difficult time has been the communal forces in different uh, uh, ways with diverse modes of representation. But in that sense, I think that it's important to say that in Venezuela, adding to some, uh, some facts, some figures to, to these presentations, we have a kind of 48,000 uh, communal councils, which are uh, community organizations that theoretically are uh, integrated by different kind of community organizations. And they are also in the urban land and also in the, in the rural land. And uh, adding to that, most of these uh, communal councils can articulate in a group in different communes. Actually, at this point in Venezuela, we have something like uh, 3,000, 3, uh, uh, 3,200 communes in the whole country. Uh, and adding to that, you have this uh, organization that also Juan Carlos and, and Jose Felix has mentioned, but are the local committees for the, for the uh, uh, for food supplies, which we call CRAP. There are about uh, 32,000 CRAPs in the whole country, which are actually responsible for the distribution of, of food uh, uh, according to official figures uh, to six million families in the, in the whole country. And maybe you can find some studies that actually point that maybe it can uh, be responsible uh, to contribute to the, to the feeding of the Venezuelan family, maybe about more than 70% of the whole uh, population. And I also want to say that uh, that contribution, that, that con concrete example, it's a representation of what Juan Carlos told us, that without that uh, whole community organization, it won't be possible to resist against the blockade, the siege, the U.S. sanctions. Uh, and in that matter, I, I maybe want to um, say that it opens a process of different kind of disputes. You, can, you have, by one hand, this extraction center economy, although uh, nature commons, but other uh, financialization in different ways. But in the other hand, you can have self-sufficiency uh, patterns and dynamics, as our friends here has spoke today. But in the other hand, you can have uh, of course, this dispute in between this capital circulation economy uh, against a process of social reproduction uh, from the communities. And in the other hand, you also have this uh, clash between a neoliberal and modern uh, colonial uh, rationality for politics, but in the other hand, you have a uh, communal rationality that has been growing up. So what I, what I want to emphasize that we have this dispute, this clash between these possibilities in Venezuela at the, at the current crisis. And I, I, I want to end before uh, open to some questions that maybe you can put in the chat. I want to share with you uh, some little comments. Uh, of course, we can replace the participation of our comrades from El Maizal, but it's maybe important to share some specific um, issues from, from the communes in Venezuela in order that you can uh, see it better. Uh, I want to say that, as I, as I said before, in Venezuela we had something like 3,200 uh, 3, uh, communes, uh, El Maizal is one of them, and as maybe as you can see here, uh, I want to ask for forgiveness because this, this slide is in, in Spanish, but in these in this, uh, figures you can see that this is a proposal that El Maizal with different communes in the local surroundings are proposing 
they are proposing to build a communal axis, which is an agreement of different uh, communes in, a, in the same territory. Uh, so you can see here, they have, here is uh, uh, an icon for El Maizal commune. Let me put it a little bigger maybe. And you have a uh, Negro Miguel de Villuria, uh, Comuna, Adrián Moncada Commune, Juan Sabas Peralta Commune, Quintino Alvarado, Aguas Sagradas de Terepaima. So these, for example, the yellow ones are different, six different communes that are proposing to a group in a territorial axis, a communal axis, uh, with they call, which they call Arjimiro Gabaldon. Arjimiro Gabaldon, I, it's good to say that it's a, a guerrilla warrior from the 60s, uh, uh, of course a leftist warrior, and, and they are uh, regaining this process of, 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 of battle. Also, also in, the, in, the, in the local, they are also proposing another uh, communal axis that they call Fabricio Hera, which is also uh, uh, a, a, a guerrilla warrior, leftist uh, guerrilla warrior, revolutionary uh, guerrilla warrior uh, from the 60s. And they are also proposing to a group different communes in this communal axis. I, I just want to, to show you that, for example, this is kind of a, a, a representation of the process of a groupment of different uh, uh, communal organizations. You can see communal councils that are the, the, the blue ones. There's a blue, right? Uh, then you have that they can agree in a commune, and then you can have several communes that can agree in what they call a corridor or a communal axis. And some of this communal axis can actually agree in a communal city. I, I, I want to commend this because this is actually part of in Venezuela, uh, um, addressing to the last discussion that we had during these years of uh, these days of the forum, of uh, a proposal of building an alternative system from below, from the communal way. Most people call of this the building of a communal state, if is that's possible, but also the possibility of building a communal horizon, uh, as as we are also talk about. Then I, I want to share. Uh, that maybe in, in El Maizal, you also can have in this, in this process, this, this is just a case example that I wanna uh, uh, share with you. Uh, they start in 2010 with the rescue of some facilities that they have abandoned, uh, um, in the in the local in the local area, and they use it like a, a people's observatory for reality. But also, they have uh, rescued an abandoned farm in 2014. Then they also uh, start a process of recuperation and self-management control of different. Uh, uh, um, how do you call uh, those? Uh, the, the gardens, the protected gardens uh, for production that were also abandoned. So when you see this path of, the, of this commune, you can, said, you can say that they have been taking control, regaining control of the territory of the different, of the, of different uh, abandoned facilities that were before part of the, of the deindustrialization or process of uh, uh, decreasing the production factors in the territory. So uh, it's a history of uh, rebuilding all these, all these facilities and taking control of them for self-management process. And finally, uh, I wanna give you some figures about it. For example, in, this, uh, in one of the communal axes, you can say that, for example, the El Maizal commune has uh, an extension between the whole uh, communal councils uh, about uh, 131,000 uh, hectares. Uh, the other commune, it's around uh, 50,000 hectares. And Adrián Moncada commune has 
uh, 10,000 hectares. They have, uh, between the three of them, 67 uh, communal councils, which is something like uh, maybe uh, nearby 30,000 families. And they have, between all of them in this communal axis, uh, nearby uh, 19 coming, uh, production unit, units. And just for a, a little finish in this, in this comment, in this case, you can have the, between all of them, they can produce, this is for 2019, they had uh, 10,000 10, tons of different kind of fruit. Uh, producing in this whole communal axis. Most of the production for the families in the local area and even a little more. Uh, for example, like 9.4 uh, tons of, of, of corn, specifically white and, and, and yellow corn. Also, uh, uh, a half a third of ton of uh, black beans, which is actually really popular here in Venezuela. Uh, 96 ton of pork, uh, 51 beef, uh, beef meat, uh, 51 tons, uh, on coffee, uh, 35 tons in the year, and cheese, to, um, 27 ton in the year. This is just an example uh, from two years ago, but I kind of want to share all these figures with you in order that you can have a better picture of this. Of course, it's not the same that if we had our friend, our comrade Angel Prado here, but I want to share this. This is also a, a, a product that you can see in Spanish so far in, in, a, in a web link of uh, some friends from Códigos Libres Collective, but uh, which is called Comunizar el Poder. Now I can share in the in the chat of the of the meeting the the link, the link side, the website, so you can add, uh, can have access to this whenever you want. So just a few facts that are that I will that I was wondering to to share with you. So someone is actually asking a question about uh, milicias populares, people's militia. Uh, so I, I don't know if maybe some of, of the panel wanna add something in there, but so far in Venezuela, from uh, for the last years, uh, they have been building a policy where the people could be part of the army forces, and as a result, uh, uh, and and has been increasing with the whole threats from the United States, uh, from blockade and possible intervention, and even kind of process of, of, of uh, military threat from Colombia and Brazil and the, and the neighborhoods. And you know that uh, recently, United States has uh, positioned a uh, um, uh, Navy float in the Caribbean in order to have some kind of uh, military blockade in the, in the Caribbean Sea. So with that thing, uh, Regarding to that, in the last years in Venezuela, we have something like two million persons in the people's militia. The people's militia is one has been added as a component in the whole uh, military forces, the Bolivarian military, for, military forces that are composed by Navy, Army, National Guard, uh, and, uh, and the people's militia. There's only four, no? Uh, so that's kind of part of the answer. I, I have to say that in the last time, in the last years, uh, in the increasing uh, in the threats from the United States, uh, it has been several exercises uh, uh, each time uh, between the army force and the people's militia uh, of different strategies of, of struggle and defense even in the, in the countryside, also in the, in the rural side. And we can see some results. Recently, two, two months ago, there has been uh, like a military intrusion, kind of pay of bricks uh, by the Cochinos in Cuba. They enter some military, uh, paramilitary cells into Venezuela, and they have been captured. 
by these people's militia in different in different countries of the in different village of the of the country. So, so there's a there's a question for all the panel, but also specifically for for Juan Carlos, or especially uh, for Juan Carlos. Uh, maybe we can give the mic to Juan Carlos to respond. Bueno, yo creo que ahí digamos cómo hacer efectiva la política en el caso nuestro. La base fundamental es toda la organización comunal que se ha venido construyendo. O sea, hay una realidad que es que el 70% de la población... La realidad es que el 70% de la población en Venezuela está incorporada de in una manera o de otra en un movimiento grassroots. Tal vez están trabajando en una comisión de salud comité en el Comunal Council, en una organización de peasant production. Tal vez están parte de las militias so there is a great majority of the people that are incorporated to the different forms of communal organization that have been created during the Bolivarian Revolution. Some of them have been promoted by the states, but others have been self-managed organizations. In our case, in the settlers movement, this is an organization that we built and we manage ourselves from our own initiative. So this is our strength. Even though the private sector concentrates most of the finances because the income in dollars is mainly in the private sector, the labor force with production capacity is in the communal organizations. So I believe that this is the tension that has been created. We need to think about the path that we're going to follow, whether the private or the public sector. So I think the government should try to strengthen all these forms of communal organization so that they can become stronger and have a greater economic capacity and a greater production capacity because they also produ produce consumption goods. So the logic of the private sector and the logic of the communal sector are completely opposite. The private sector produces imports and reproduces for profit, but the communal sector produces for life, for things that we need. But from the government, there needs to be a, the political intention to strengthen that way of organization so that at some point it get, can transcend the renterist logic. If we have an economic approach with a renterism logic, the communal organizations will not be able to survive. So I was talking about subjectivity, but it isn't only the neoliberal subjectivity. It is related to modern subjectivity. If this continues to be the approach for the economy, the private sector will continue to have a higher influence in public policies. So this is a battle a battle for subjectivity mainly, a battle for the hegemony of subjectivity and the horizon that we want to create in this historical moment. I think that question is very complex. We need to understand that we're trying to make a structural change, a revolutionary change within the rules of uh, the liberalized Western democracy. Even though the first thing Chavez did or the Bolivarian movement of Chavez did was the transformation of the constitution to try and position the concept of participatory democracy so this is 
a contradiction. that is going to be present all along these 20 years and in the following years, because we need to try to establish, as Pedro said, it's Carlos, excuse me, I'm sorry. It is a construction of the hegemony from uh, the labor sector, from the popular sector, and it, it is a very complex, complex issue because who can understand that a country that produces oil, that has oil income, works mostly in the countryside and the peasants are completely organized. Of course, this is a very particular situation. This is this suggests a process of social change that took on a form of struggle that is different from the struggle that we led in the 60s, that was an armed struggle, to displace the dominant sectors. But right now we are taking the government and the state, but we don't have the economic power to do things. We keep coexisting with dominant social classes or with capitalist social classes. And we try to build a parallel power, taking advantage of the democratic liberties between within the constitutional framework. When I was uh, listening to the previous presentations, if we create an inventory of all of the laws that we have passed, they are all anti-hegemony laws. For example, the, the law for seeds, the law for land, they are all against hegemony and the loss of the people's power. This is a fundamental law. So in reality, we cannot transform everything with laws. In the National Assembly, in the previous National Assembly, I was saying that this uh, revolution was trying to transform reality through the legal framework because it legitimates the struggle of the emerging sectors the alternative sectors, and it allows us to coexist with, for example, the banking sector, which from my point of view, this is a very personal opinion of mine, we cannot have a transformation, we cannot have a structural or development transformation if the banking sector is a parasite that takes all the capital of the country. And this is part of the cause of this problem. So this is about the construction of something that is not easy because it is a hegemony that is led by different sectors that have a certain amount of autonomy because we have to, to create the popular movement from the state and that is not easy. So it is a combination of different factors. The support of the state, which does not have the economic power and it has a confrontation, the other sectors. The first thing that is done by the dominant sectors, by the bourgeoisie, by the corporate sectors, the first thing they did was to destroy the law of the land. In the United States, it would be a crime. You would go to prison for doing this. But this reflects that there is a class struggle. This is a very particular process. It is difficult to label this process. We could not say if it is socialist or not. It is not easy to do this because of we have seen and we have worked on so far. It is a combination. We have a constitution that 
which uh, gives a more importance to mixed economy, but some sectors want to turn the social economy into the dominant sector. So the Bolivarian process needs to be understood from the outside. It is very difficult to do it. We try to understand it from the inside. We have been working on this for 20 years. But as I said, we need to coexist with this situation. I don't know if I made myself clear or maybe a little, I, I made it a little more difficult. So thanks, Jose Felix. Uh, we have another question here in our uh, chat, which says, are the guardians of the forest of the Yanomami communities at the frontier of Venezuela with Brazil are like part of the militias populares, or is it the different communal management of security protection of territories? So for that, I will ask our friend Ana Felician to give us some thoughts about it. Hola, well, I'm not a specialist in indigenous uh, territories, but what we know is, first of all, Yanomami is a First Nation or are indigenous people, and they have a lot of community in, Vene in Venezuela and in Brazil. So they are not part of the militias populares. They, are, they have their own uh, um, indigenous organization and authorities and um, strategies for self-defense of the territories uh, based in their own indigenous laws and governance mechanisms. So we don't know if in the Brazilian uh, area of Yanomami territory, territory, there are something like uh, a Western organization of indigenous communities, but in Venezuela, we don't know that the, specifically the Yanomami peoples are involved in all these uh, militia organization. It's different for other indigenous people which have a more, um, contact with the Western or Criollo society. Maybe we can add a, a, a final round of comments uh, from the panel in order to close the session. Is it okay, Kinchi? Yeah, uh, I would like to thank you all for being here and, and for listening to us uh, speak for so long. <laughs> um, I think I would uh, uh, like to finish to this final intervention by um, insisting on the urgency of uh, putting uh, women's lives and health uh, first in any kind of alternative that we are thinking about uh, when in terms of uh, sustainability of life beyond COVID and beyond uh, capitalism, especially in our society, in Venezuelan society, as well as most of the global south, where women hold such a central position in uh, in most of uh, the symbolic construction of society as well as in material construction of society. Uh, I, I fully agree with all of the interventions of, my, of, of, of the people before me. Um, I think everything I shared with you in terms of, of, day, of, 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 uh, of dates and of um, data, uh, statistics, etc., is completely uh, located in a context of, of multiple overlapping crises and even civilizatory crises. Uh, and I still believe that the, the Venezuelan states, uh, and particularly the Venezuelan government, not so much the Venezuelan state, and the Bolivarian process is uh, our biggest ally as women here in Venezuela right now, uh, even though it, is, it continues to have a, a very big debt towards Venezuelan women in terms of uh, of, of access to rights as well as uh, other historical debts that the state has with women. Uh, but I still believe it's, it's a lot more likely that we achieve those or that we satisfy those debts with the Bolivarian process that with, than without it. Um, I believe without this, uh, this government that still aims to protect us in spite of very, uh, of such complex circumstances, I believe it is a lot more likely that we'll be able to survive this triple crisis and we'll be able to find an alternative to sustain life when the COVID passes. Um, first, thank you for listening to us <laughs> in our very Venezuelan dynamic. And 
it's really important also to see among our uh, co-speakers <laughs> that we pose a very important issue related with the generation of information and data. No? From below, we have been building another kind of relations and subjects and organization forms and all that, that almost um, invisible, when well, there are actually invisible for the mainstream uh, narrative about Venezuela situation, even during the COVID. No? So I think for us, among us, but also for the alliances uh, emerging from international solidarity, this is a very important issue no? to try to think how we can share more uh, information even from the other processes with similar um, agendas for a struggle in defending the very basic uh, rights for life from the right to food, the right to women's and child's, and uh, the right to habit, ¿Cómo se dice? vivienda, <laughs> house. So this is, these rights could also tend bridges for others' agendas in the social movement. And we can also share perspective of the same agendas which are confronting the same challenges uh, in front of COVID and climate and global change. No? So in a global scale, we can also try to make a map for what are the common points uh, among us uh, in the, a pesar de the speed of the, the very huge geographical distance. And thank you again for listening us. <laughs> bueno, yo quisiera volver a plantear que me parece importante que este canal de intercambio for this exchange channel which is open with China that this channel can be used to, to exchange visions on civilizing projects how do you see this global situation what are the alternatives in order for us to overcome created by this civilizing project and how we see this project from venezuela so i think this could be the challenge and thanks to these channels that are built we can then discuss what type of alternatives are could be implemented or are being implemented over there in China and here in Venezuela to be able to exchange from concrete subjects, building this new approach here in Venezuela. And those subjects who are over there in Asia, specifically in China, are doing the same how we can exchange so we can debate these ideas. This is just um, a suggestion for future activities that we might have in the future. Again, thank you very much for this opportunity to share, to meet again, to discuss our ideas in the case of uh, Venezuela in um, Latin America at large first we need to try to understand the features of capitalism in our region Juan Carlos mentioned something that I didn't develop namely how the model of insertion, the, our model of uh, oil rentier model is in crisis. And the crisis is no more acute today. It's been acute since the 70s. Already in the 70s, this model was in crisis because, for instance, to resolve the energy situation, it creates a network of uh, power distribution, which is so huge and ill adapted to our reality 
that today it has created a value chain for accumulation and not distribution of energy. So we need to think about how to generate new type of energy sources, a new type of production, a new, a new way of building our cities. Well, in this reality is a huge opportunity. I am against or the new management uh, managerial tools offered to people. <coughs> Based on the reality we have, uh, we see the possibility to move forward towards proposals that uh, give rise to new ways to produce, to generate energy, to apply science and technology, and also new ways to live and coexist. Venezuela, in this sense, could be a laboratory, not only of ideas and concepts and visions, but of practice. So this is basically my uh, closing comment. So maybe as a final comment, I want to say that uh, it has been a really important exchange. Um, last year, we had a, a we had I have participated of this forum, and I shared with some of you about how during these last twenty years in Venezuela we have been building a communal way into socialism. That's a, a reader uh, which is the, uh, available in the website of the uh, previous forum. And actually in this one, it's the same paper, but in Spanish. So I think that's quite important to go there. Maybe some of you can check in there because someone was asking about the, uh, all the process of organization, of people's organization and coming organization initiative. And I think that in there you can see the diversity which uh, main principle has been uh, to promote, to give impulse to the Bolivarian Revolution, the people's organization has been a key factor. Maybe Bolivarian Revolution has been about uh, democratization of the oil income, uh, translating it into rights, into guarantee of rights for the majorities, and also, it's about sovereignty uh, struggle and also anti-imperialism. And to propose the socialism, but with the people's organization as a vehicle. For example, in Venezuela, all that we have advanced in uh, public services, as water, as education, as uh, rural roads, as community production, has been thanks to the uh, control of the oil income, but also thanks to the people's organization. I think the United States has uh, actually noticed that we are dependent of the oil income. So they have been decreasing it as well has characterized uh, our friend Jose Felix, but people's organization is even more difficult to decrease. Of course, with the blockade, with the sanctions, it has been decreasing and has been deteriorated has difficulties, but it's still there. And I think that we, all of us, share the idea that actually this community force in his different presentations could be club, could be communal council, could be commune, could be feminist organizations, could be indigenous organization, could be Afro organizations, several ones, but all of them are the different uh, power in the struggle against imperialism. And I think that actually, uh, and I celebrate and I thank this invitation uh, from our friends from the Global EU program, because it can give us the opportunity to see and recognize ourselves in that common struggles. When I see the proposals from our friends who actually says that in China, uh, in the different uh, cycle crisis of capital, the difference has been the rural organization and the rural production and the rural China. I actually think 
in this other Venezuela, the common of Venezuela in the rural and in the urban side that has actually been the difference. So I think that that's something that we need to uh, go on uh, discussing more uh, during this process, because we need to think about this uh, alternative to building uh, different ways for production, for planning, for managing the different common issues in life. So as we all said, we are really grateful for this opportunity. Thank you very much for this, for this discussion. The next year, we promise that we will have a better connection and, and not the same interpretation problems. Thank you all for the patience. Comuna, yeah. o nada.